Hey everybody, Dr. Dan here, and this is week 14, so we're winding down. We have two more weeks, two or three more weeks left, and uh, this week we're studying chapter 13, which is about the Civil War. So this is really, um, you know, the conclusion of the class is right after the Civil War, so we're kind of up on the big event as far as the, the latter half of the semester is concerned. And if you remember last week in chapter 12, um, like the last, if you if you go back and look at the reading notes, which you probably won't do, but but the last part of the reading notes talked about the Kansas Nebraska Act, and if you remember, the Whig Party, the political party, the Whigs broke apart over issues of slavery. The new Republican Party was born. Uh, Abraham Lincoln would become a Republican, and there was a lot going on as far as uh, political parties and political alignment. As far as the backdrop of all of that. You know, everyone is talking about slavery, this increased tension. Uh, last week, we discussed briefly how sectional tensions rose as as the country moved west, and there were there was the Missouri Compromise and the Kansas-Nebraska Act and all these other uh, legislative attempts at sort of maintaining the balance between free and slave states in the Congress, but it was unsustainable, obviously. So so this week we get into, okay, what happened? How did the war start? Why did the war start? And we have an essay due this week also, and it's a really easy essay. And I think um, I'll cover that first because the essay really talks about uh, major events that led to the outbreak of the Civil War. So we'll get to that right up front because the chapter is about the Civil War. And if the essay is about how did the Civil War start, then we need to look at the beginning of the chapter, if that makes sense. So in the first section of the chapter, I think it's section 13.1 in, um, um, in the book in, in um, MindTap, there's, there's three biggies. And, and this, is, this is the whole essay question right here. So the three biggies as far as you know, major events, not ideas, but major events that occurred um, that that led to the outbreak of the Civil War. Certainly, number one is the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. And if you read about that election, or if you're reading about that election, um, you know Lincoln wasn't even on the ballot in a number of states, in the number of Southern states, because the Southern states were all dominated by the Democrats. That was the old party of Andrew Jackson, and and really the party that supported. Uh, minimal government, states' rights, westward expansion, and slavery. And so the Democrats had this stronghold in the South and actually had some people on the ballot in the North also. And the Republican Party was a new party, and it really became the party of the North exclusively. And the Republican Party was born out of the remnants of the Whigs and some of the know-nothing parties and and some of these other uh, political affiliations. And and it can be a little confusing, but the bottom line is uh, the political parties, you know, we went from the first party system, which was the Federalists and the Democrat Republicans, into the second party system, which was the Whigs and the Democrats, and now we're here at the Civil War with Republicans and Democrats. And, and the only point is, not that you have to remember all of those party alignments, but just to know that there was a lot of stuff going on. And and slavery was at the was at the crux of it. In other words, if slavery wouldn't have been an issue, the Whig Party would still be together today. I believe, um, sort of the uh, more activist party of the uh, of partisan politics in the U.S. But but that aside, just remember that um, Abraham Lincoln's election is the one major event that led to the outbreak of the Civil War. And then South Carolina's secession from the Union is the second uh, major event that led to the outbreak of the Civil War. And then, of course, the firing on Fort Sumter, which was really the, you know, the actual shot, I guess, um, that, that started the Civil War. And, and, and Fort Sumter's interesting because after South Carolina succeeds and the Confederate states begin to form, you know, they're acting like a totally different country, the, you know, the, Confeder the Confederate states versus the United States. And, and so the, the problem with that is that many of the military forts that belong to the United States of America are now in the Confederate States of America, and Fort Sumter was one of those. It was off the coast of Charleston. Charleston. So uh, Lincoln had to think about, hey, how can I... Uh, resupply my guys, my Union soldiers that are in Fort Sumter, 
Um, how can I do that? Because now I have to go into a different country, basically, the Confederate States. I have to go into their area with my uh, military ships to resupply my guys. And, um, you know, Lincoln decided he'd go for it. He pretty much had to. And when he did, when the uh, when Fort Sumter was being resupplied, uh, that's when the Confederates or the Southerners fired on Fort Sumter. They actually won that battle, and that's really when the Civil War started. So those are the three big reasons. Lincoln, 1860, South Carolina secession, and the firing of Fort Sumter. It's a pretty easy essay, and if you watch the video, you already have it done, basically. So there's that part. As far as the Civil War goes, it, in 1861, um, you know, the, the, the beginning of the war, no one really knew, I think, how horrific it was going to be. And as a matter of fact, in some of the uh, first battles um, near, near Washington, I mean, people actually kind of came out with picnic baskets and stuff to watch this war because it was glamorized and they thought it was going to be, you know, an old school war with, you know, lines of guys advancing towards each other. But but uh, quickly, quickly that impression was changed because the Civil War uh, was, was really one of the first in major industrial wars fought. And by that, I mean there were all kinds of new weapons, uh, automatic weapons, um, you know, accurate rifles. And um, as, as modernized as the weapons were, they were still very crude by today's standards. And I only mention that is because the injuries sustained um, from the firing of these weapons was horrific. And when you couple that with a total lack of knowledge of health care, medical care, no preparation as far as um, nursing <laughs> goes, a little bit driven by nurses, but, but really no preparation as far as the medical needs, uh, it was horrific because basically medical care in the Civil War basically involved amputations because there wasn't anything else anyone could do. So it was brutal in the sense that it was one of the first industrial wars. It was um, uh, brutal from the standpoint of injuries sustained and the you know these battles as you read through them like the Battle of Shiloh or Antietam, any of those, you know, you're talking 20, 40, 50,000 guys die in one day. And they're just mowed down in these open fields because, again, they're using old battle tactics with new weapons, and it was uh, it was a disaster. You'll read about something in the chapter called Pickett's Charge, where the commander, Pickett, you know, is just telling his guys to run out in the open field to attack the enemy, and they're all getting mowed down with rifles and automatic weapons. So, so really awful from that standpoint. Again, one of these situations where the weapons advanced, but the tactics for fighting a war didn't, and, and that never goes well. So, when the war started, it was kind of romanticized that, oh, it was so cool to be a soldier and these battles were going to be glamorous. Um, but in reality, it was totally the opposite of that. And um, the soldiers and the people involved, including Abraham Lincoln, you know, rapidly found out that this was going to be a much more brutal challenge than, than maybe they had considered up front. So um, the, uh, the chapter will take you through various battles. And I think... Um, you know, I'm not much of a war guy as far as knowing the ins and outs of all the battles, but I think one of the important things is to remember, or to remember is that um, one of the strategies of the North, the Union troops, was to uh, prevent the South from getting any revenue, in other words, cutting them off from any kind of money, and then also cutting them off from any kind of shipping. That means uh, shipping where they could be re resupplied, but also exports. So the Union Army right away early on uh, worked on a strategy to sort of uh, cut off the South and around the East Coast of the U.S. and around the Florida coast, that was fairly easy. Um, but the Union had to get to New Orleans, too, because one of the prime strategies was, hey, if we can block off shipping on the Mississippi, then um, Confederate troops can't get any supplies, and also the Confederacy can't ship any cotton overseas. They can't sell any cotton for revenue. And, and so um, that was sort of the, that's sort of the big overarching strategic move that the Union made that was really successful. Now, um, what you'll read about in the book is all the individual battles, and they're important, every one of them. Um, you know, whether you're talking about uh, Gettysburg or Shiloh or Vicksburg, uh, a number of these battles you read about. And, and one of the reasons I picked this textbook is because 
um, it's it's really easy to understand these battles. They don't spend a lot of time in them. Uh, they they sort of tell you what happened and why, and then move on. So you can go through them fairly easily. Um, obviously, uh, a lot dead, and uh, the the familiar names you hear about. Uh, Grant for the Union, uh, General Grant, uh, you'll read about him, and then also Robert E. Lee for the Confederacy, uh, you'll read about him as well. And 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 I encourage you, some of you have probably visited these Civil War sites. Um, a lot of people have done that. They're close to Ohio if you live here. Um, but um, I, I encourage you to sort of read through MindTap because um, it, it's interesting, especially if you've avoided the Civil War because you, you didn't want to read about all the battles. Uh, I think the textbook does a really a really good job on it. Um, the other thing I think the textbook does a good job on is really discusses the social aspects of the war. So it's hard for you and me to understand Southern culture, but Southern culture was, um, I think, really different than maybe some of us think about it today. I mean, some of us think about uh, maybe a more rural culture, maybe sometimes not as sophisticated in some ways, but but in reality, uh, in the antebellum era, you know, these plantation owners. And, and Southern culture had this um, real hierarchy of the way they operated. And of course they were, you know, racist as hell. So we know that part, but um, the, the, the well-off, the upper middle class there, the plantation owners, you know, lived in a, in a very uh, formal way in very formal homes with very formal social hierarchy. So you knew your place in society. And um, especially the planners, they, you know, they lived like kings of their own castle. And, and so now what happens is during the Civil War, the battlefield, actually the battles are in the South. So these giant farms and these big plantations and towns and villages are totally disrupted, uh, not only by Union soldiers coming through, but by battles right in their backyard. So... Um, um, it was really transformative for the South, and it ends up in the end that a lot of Southerners just couldn't take it anymore because they didn't have any food, um, and, and their society had completely collapsed. And so um, the, the hearts and minds of the Southern people certainly tired of the war rapidly, I would say more rapidly than the North did. And also, um, the, the, the big problem with the South is they weren't industrial at all. I mean, there was like one iron mill, I think, in, in Richmond, Tredegar Works. So, you know, they didn't have the industry that the North had. So uh, producing bullets, guns, um, you know, they had poor transportation, all of those things that you needed to conduct a modern war successfully, uh, the South ran short of very quickly. Now, it's it's you should give credit to to the Confederate Army and to the Confederate States because they did gear up quickly uh, to produce materials of war. But at the same time, they would forever be hampered by a lack of supplies and um, a lack of armaments. Whereas the North wasn't going to have any trouble like that because the North was highly industrialized uh, as it is today. It was back then. So not only was the North industrialized, but but uh, they had. A superior transportation routes, uh, you know, more track, more miles of railroad tracks, that sort of thing. And so um, when you read about how the South was transformed really in a negative way by this intrusion of war, when you read about the North and how it was transformed, you're going to read more about all the money that was made by uh, vendors and manufacturers who were um, uh, manufacturing material to supply the war, the war effort. So the big difference between the South and the North, plus the fact that the war was going on in the South, not in the North. So wherever the war is actually happening, regardless of the war it is, um, that area you know, is going to be a lot worse off than uh, where the war isn't happening. A good example would be World War II. You know, Europe was left devastated. The U.S. was untouched. So this idea that the South had to put up with the actual destruction of war, the North didn't have to do any of that. And um, the North, you know, really rocked as far as economic uh, activity goes because of manufacturing, because of food manufacturing. And you'll re also read something about uh, the quartermaster, quartermaster department basically just means the federal government. Um, the federal government was supplying contracts to all these northern uh, manufacturers to make stuff for the war effort, which was extremely profitable. So read about that. Um, the other cool, uh, the cool thing is for any of you that are uh, nursing students in here or nursing majors, 
was that really modern nursing really sort of began around um, around the Civil War. And you maybe you've heard about Clara Barton before, but there was this uh, commission formed called the U.S. Sanitary Commission, and it was a civilian organization and uh, it, uh, stock, you know, staffed by mainly women. And it was a, a, a major source of medical and nutritional aid for the soldiers because the armies, whether it was the Union or the Confederate armies, you know, they were totally unprepared for the medical end and, and nutrition certainly uh, also. So um, I think it's interesting that uh, nursing really came of age during the Civil War. And uh, again, I mentioned Clara Barton, if you've heard of her. Uh, if you're interested, if you're a nursing student, maybe you've already heard of her, but, but you know, check her out as far as her advocacy for healthcare and nursing. And she went on actually to, to uh, she founded the Red Cross. So Clara Barton was very active um, in, in healthcare as far as assisting the Civil War and the war effort goes. So there's that. Now, you know, the big competition, anytime you get historians together is, you know, what was the cause of the Civil War? Was it, you know, was it slavery or states' rights? And, and I think the book has something about that. Um, that's a silly argument. We don't need to argue about that. I mean, you can say it was slavery, you can say it's states' rights, but in this context, they're one and the same. So if, if you went to a Southerner in the antebellum era and said, hey, how do you feel about states' rights? They'd say, well, states should have the rights to do whatever they want. And you would say, well, why do you feel so strongly about it? And they would say, because I don't want anyone taking away my slaves. So the state's rights slavery argument, I think, is a total waste of time. I've never figured it out. I've very respected historians, spent a lot of time on this. But really, what difference does it make? Um, the war ended up being about slavery. And when you get to thir uh, section 13.5 in your book, which talks about emancipation, it really talks about the fact that the war didn't start over slavery. I mean, when when the war started, Lincoln basically wanted to, you know, he would have left slavery alone. At any time during the war prior to um, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, um, Lincoln would have been fine with ending the war and leaving slavery in place. Lincoln's big thing at the beginning of the war was that uh, slavery shouldn't expand. Okay, so it was really about this westward expansion. That was Lincoln's thing. Slavery shouldn't expand. And I think Lincoln, along with several other well-meaning Republicans, thought that if they could outlaw the slave trade, if they would allow slavery not to expand, then eventually the practice might fade away. That was sort of their idea, I think. And it was, uh, it was understandable because Lincoln, after all, was a politician. And, you know, there are special interests in politics like anything else. We still have them today. And, and I think Lincoln knew that if the Republican Party would have come out right away and said, hey, we want to, you know, we want to eliminate slavery. Well, he would have lost any support from the states that bordered the North and South because some of those states, Kentucky, Tennessee, um, you know, they were, they were sort of a hybrid. I mean, there was some slavery going on there, but there were a lot of abolitionists there too as well. So Lincoln had to be careful to not come out and say, hey, we want to, you know, we want to emancipate everybody and eliminate slavery. That was not what he was going into the Civil War for. But um, as, as the war began to move on, um, as Northern troops uh, recruited the assistance of freed slaves, as um, as as it as it turned out that the it, it looked like the war might last way too long, um, then Lincoln came around and said, you know what, um, along with the radical Republicans, we need to make a, a stronger stand here. In other words, it's going to be impossible to uh, you know keep slavery in some areas, you know make it illegal in other areas because the same conflict which would come up again and again. So he really kind of came to the to the realization that. Um, you know, the country was already split and things had already fallen apart politically. So why not say, hey, this, this is really all about emancipation. And, and he had support of a number of the Northerners. Uh, and, and there's an interesting thing in the textbook about the Northern soldiers who, you know, if you ask them back then, they would tell you, hey, we're fighting, we're fighting over slavery. So there was this common um, uh, impulse amongst soldiers and amongst the population that slavery needed to be ended once and for all. So, you know, Lincoln delivers the Emancipation Proclamation 
Uh, he waits. He waits for the right time. He waits until the Union Army is in a is in a good position, and and at that point, um, you know, the 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 war, the war, of the North, the soldiers, everybody kind of began to rally uh, uh, for emancipation. So it it gave the North an, a little extra push that they needed. And, and really led to the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery, which was ratified in 1865. So, so um, you should know what the 13th Amendment is. You should know the Emancipation Proclamation is exactly that. It's Lincoln's proclamation that uh, slavery would be over and that all the slaves should be freed. And um, that's that. And so at the very end of the war, the war did in turn or the war did indeed um, uh, convert to a war that was uh, blatantly over over uh, slavery. As far as the rest of the chapter goes, it talks about the soldiers and um, the technology and the devastation and the injuries, which I already addressed. It talks about um, how the um, how the tide of the war turned through different battles. Uh, Vicksburg is a really big one in the West, so you'll look about look at that. Um, and then it will talk about disunity in the South, North, and West, and I think we covered most of that. Um, the big point being, and I touched upon it earlier, that Southerners got um, tired of the war quickly because, again, you know, it disrupted their entire social order um, and, and, and disrupted where they lived and disrupted what they ate, and, you know, all of a sudden you had these um, these beautiful towns before the war that were transformed into ghost towns with um, with freed slaves and Union soldiers and who else kind of running around. So uh, the South wanted, many Southerners wanted the war to end, and I think the book does a good job in section 13.8 talking about that. And then um, finally, 13.9 uh, is the final test of wills. Um, the, the one thing I want to say about that last section is, because I don't think we really consider it that much, as I began this lecture talking about the fact that the Confederacy was really a different country, well, the Confederacy was acting like a different country, and, and they were, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederate States, was reaching out to England and was reaching out to France and other countries trying to find allies uh, to supply them with weapons, uh, trying to uh, go to England and say, hey, we're your main cotton suppliers and we need help. But the Allies uh, never came, and the the uh, the Union Army, Lincoln, they really feared that someone in Europe would recognize the Confederate States, and if that happened, that would have been a huge problem because then you literally would have had two countries in place with separate uh, foreign alignments uh, here in North America, and who knows how that would have ended. But the fact is that uh, those alliances from around the world never came, to help the Confederacy, and the 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 war couldn't couldn't be uh, couldn't be maintained because the Confederates were out of supplies, out of morale, and no longer had the hearts and minds of the people in the South. So um, that's kind of the chapter. the uh, The war ends on April 9th, uh, 1865, at Appomattox. Lee surrenders, and then uh, five days later, Lincoln is ass is assassinated at uh, Ford Theater. So. You know, you probably know that part of the story. So uh, we'll talk about Reconstruction next. I think that the Civil War chapter is a great one. And uh, remember that essay, those three events from the beginning of the chapter that led to the outbreak of the Civil War, and you'll be all set. So if you have any questions, let me know. Have a great day. Sorry this is so long. See you next week. Bye-bye.